This is another episode of Stand Up Comedy, your host and MC, celebrating 40 plus years on the fringe of show business. Stories, interviews, and comedy sets from the famous and not so famous. Here's your host and MC, Scott Edwards. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Stand Up Comedy. Your host and MC, and I have another fun interview with a great friend in comedy. This gentleman worked my club for many, many years. He uh, participated in many of the side of events I did and has a really interesting story. He started off as an elementary school teacher. And he even was a substitute teacher in South Central L.A., if you could believe that. But all that led to material that took him into stand-up comedy. Let's hear a little bit about that. Ladies and gentlemen, the star of our show today, it's Jimmy Burns. (laughs) Jimmy, so great to reconnect with you. We had a chance to... uh, do the comedy roundtable with uh, Stan Sellers and you, but I wanted to do a show focused on your story. Thank you. You're right. I didn't know when to come in. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is different in the sense that you were able to build a very successful stand up comedy career kind of based on your first career, which was that as a school teacher, right? Yeah. Did a lot of material from teaching. And then it turned out that there was some call for it for teacher convention type stuff and meetings and seminars. And I was able to do some of that and make some teachers laugh. Well, it seems like a natural transition in the sense that what's I've always said important about stand-up comedy is being able to relate to the audience. And of course, everybody in the audience, uh, not only are there a lot of teachers and administrators, but everyone's been a student. So your material becomes something everybody can relate to, but we're jumping ahead a little bit. Maybe you could share the story. How did you kind of, fall into stand-up comedy or do that transition from being a uh, terrific teacher, I've heard, to uh, going into comedy? I was born and raised in Omaha, Nebraska, so that's hometown. And uh, I I couldn't really figure out where I, want, where I fit or where I wanted to go. So I went to college, and my brother was a federal agent, you know, and I thought, well, I want to be like my brother. And then I said, I don't want to carry a gun. And <laughs> I don't, if you're carrying a gun, other people are carrying a gun too. So I, uh, I, I loved school. I loved school activities. I loved classroom. I loved recess. I loved it. So I went to, t- I started teaching elementary school and it was going along fun and everything, but it just wasn't satisfying. And I was married at the time. First marriage. We have to number them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, now, did you get your credential? How long were you teaching? I got my credential in Nebraska, and I taught there for five years. I taught. Okay, it's so called, that's a commitment. Yeah, non-public. I was Title One math. It's the remedial math. Okay. Fund, federally funded, and I did that for four years, and, I, and then I taught a regular fifth grade classroom. Then I got the bug. Uh, to be honest with you, it was not a lot. The marriage wasn't too fun and happy, you know. So I was looking for an outlet, and there was a comedy competition in town. Because back, we're talking back in the days where comedy clubs weren't every other city and all that stuff, you know, before all the funny bones and on and on. Right. This is late seventies, early eighties, right? Exactly. So there was a comedy night, and I went out and I did it. It was a competition, and I didn't win or anything. But the guy was supportive enough. He said, "Hey, why don't you?" do our finals you know because it'll be besides everybody singing and all that stuff and we'll do some comedy so that's that's how i got it and i just got hooked i loved it and so that was kind of your first uh launch into stand-up do you remember any of your early jokes or your first joke good question um <laughs> that's why i do it i remember mcdonald oh yeah that's why you do what you do uh some about mcdonald's hamburgers you couldn't find out meat because it was hiding under the pickle <laughs> well everybody can relate to mcdonald's so your first bit wasn't actually about being a teacher it was about something a little more generic like mcdonald's which i think is a perfect way to start your you know open mic type uh sets right oh yeah because oh this is interesting i think this is funny because i didn't necessarily tell everybody i was a teacher you know what i mean i just started going up and telling jokes but then i had a friend 
I don't know if it was around the country. It was called PM Magazine. It was a little magazine. Oh, yeah. Show. Yeah, it was local. They did a story on us on our local PM Magazine. Yeah. Well, a guy that I met, Terry Pfeffer, who was the host of the one in Omaha, Nebraska, wanted to come up and just do what you're talking about. Bring a camera to my classroom and show that there was another side of teaching for our teachers. And the funny part was, I didn't know if parents would want the camera in the classroom. And, and I had to get the, my permission from my principal. So I, I went to the principal's office after school. And I said, uh, Ms. Franklin, can we speak? She went, sure. And I said, I, I need to shut the door now. And she went, really? <laughs> so I'm going to tell you right now, most teachers, when they come into my office after school and want to talk about something and shut the door, they're pregnant. <laughs> and I say, well, Miss, I am not pregnant. I can say that I'm a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> she said, you sure? I'd rather you were pregnant, I think. Anyway, but she, uh, so she gave, she said, no, I'm, I'm glad you have another outlet. I think that's good for creativity in the classroom and bring it together. And she gave the permission. Turned out the parents were all for it. They would love to have camera come out and do a segment on it and air it on the news. And, they loved it. I was surprised. Oh, well, that's really good because I think that the uh, the idea of the story where teachers are more than just teachers, that they have other dimensions, uh, other aspects of their life that they can bring to the classroom uh, on an educational level. And stand-up comedy is certainly something, comedy just in general, helps teachers relate to an audience. We all remember our favorite teacher and almost always it was the one that made things fun. You know, I can't agree with you more because in my mind, you're open when you're smiling. You're open to whatever's been, and when you're upset or mad, you close off. And that's, so I wanted my kids to be, I wanted my students to be open and understanding and open to whatever I was saying and, they could be open and share in the conversation, whatever it was. You know what I'm saying? No, no, that's that's a, a great explanation. So how did the uh, PM Magazine story come out? Were you happy with it? I was. Well, going back to Omaha, Nebraska, if you remember, Johnny Carson was from Omaha, Nebraska, even though he was born, I think, in Iowa, but he was raised in Norfolk, Nebraska. And so they compared... It was nice. They put shots of Johnny Carson starting out, and they put pictures of me starting out, and said, "Who knows? Maybe another Omaha will." Oh, that's become... cool. Yeah, it was very cool. Congratulations! Another... That's that's, but that's that kind of comparison is very complimentary, and uh, I'm so glad that the school and the parents and the students all supported it because. Uh, in this day and age, that might be difficult to do. So when did you um, get your first paid gig? I think it was in Omaha. And it was because the College World Series, the teams come to the College World Series. The home is still, back then it was in Omaha, Nebraska, and it's still in Omaha, Nebraska, which is funny because the coaches used to say, we love that it's in Omaha, Nebraska, because there's nothing to do in Omaha. <laughs> <laughs> and... The parents and baseball players would say, we hate going to Omaha because there's nothing to do. So they did a show, and I did a show for some baseball teams, and I think that was my first payday, my first check. Oh, that's cool. That would be yeah. a fun fun show, and I bet the baseball players enjoyed just having something to go to that was entertaining. Exactly. Yeah. So that was it. So I, I taught school for five years, and then I made the jump to moving to California. Was that about 82, 83? What year was that? Wow, 81. 81, okay. That, Nicely that early. done. Well, I was yeah. trying to figure out how, because I know when you came to Laughs Unlimited, um, and I'd like you to share the story of your, your first encounter with working for me, but I know that you came on board early on and worked for me for you know over a decade. Oh, yeah. Um, when Do you know when that would be, or would that be early 80s? Uh, yeah, it had to be about 82, 83, because I started in 1980. If you came out to California in 81, the math seems to work out. Did you move straight to L.A.? Yes. Uh, I took a big trip, the vacation, the summer vacation for a teacher before the move, because I checked out whether I should go to Chicago. I looked at San Francisco, and I looked at L.A., 
and I ended up just coming straight to LA. You know, that was probably a smart move because one of the things we've discussed about before on this podcast is that you could become a big fish in something like Sacramento, San Francisco, or even Portland. But as soon as you go to LA, you're starting over. You have to kind of reprove yourself. So by right. getting an early foothold in the um, television media town of Los Angeles and Hollywood, uh, probably helped your career because I, I alluded to it, but you've had over 30 years of professional stage work and that that's not something very many people can uh, uh, compare to you, that you've had a great career. Well, we should, I should give credit where credit to do in the sense of, uh, I, I showcased audition for Bob Fisher at the Ice House in Pasadena which they, they say is the oldest comedy club in the country. It was a hoot nanny and comedy thing back in the 60s. It opened in 1960. And I showcased, and uh, I, I was doing their work on the road because everybody had to work on the road in the 80s and 90s. But I became the house MC, the weekend MC guy at the Ice House in uh, about 1997, 1996. And was there until 2020. Yeah. So that's where I met people that I was able to work with through my career. That's where I opened for, I met George Lopez and Brad Garrett and Richard Jenny and Arsenio Hall. Yeah. The people you ended up opening with in concert uh, around the country. That's impressive. Let's not jump too far ahead. Let's go back to the uh, early eighties. Do you remember your first trip to uh, laughs unlimited? It was probably, well, there's so many trips. It was so good because you used to, when was stock? When did Stockton open? Uh, that was about eighty four. Okay, so it would have been. Oh wait a minute, who did I want to It had to be Old Sack, and it was just I was on the road. I was in Sacramento. It was fun, and we had fun. And you had Citrus Heights open, so there was a week, two weeks, and then was Stockton. There was three weeks on the road, and if you. We're doing well, or at least doing a job that you appreciated. You do it two times a year. So there was six weeks out of the year I could book, you know? Yeah, that was a benefit to the comics because they could uh, set aside the income and the work for those weeks. But for me as a club owner and a producer, I felt it helped build the comics reputation. And you did that. It, it laughs unlimited with all those years of performing when I would say, hey, um, you know, Ex school teacher, now stand up comic Jimmy Burns. We always had nice crowds. That's true. And for anybody listening who cares, I hear because I don't tend to be edgy and not mean and mean spirited and stuff. And the bartenders and the servers enjoyed that because the audiences were in a good mood, which tips usually followed very well. Yeah, we've often uh, expanded on the benefits of being a clean comic. And not only is it easier to relate, you uh, um, have more fun with more people. And uh, it hasn't been mentioned too often, but you're right. It improves tipping for the wait staff because everybody's in a little bit more uh, positive mood. You know, if you have a Bobcat Goldthwait or, or even a Bobby Slayton and they're kind of it's funny stuff, but they're kind of attacking right. and more uh, abrasive. It tenses up the audience. They still have a good time, but it's not as relaxing as, uh, let's say, you or Steve Bruner or Stan Sellers, where you have a more uh, comfortable performance. Hey, you know what? I, we can compare it to what we said about teaching. The students were open. Well, the audience was open. And when you're open, the money flows a little bit more. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, we know we appreciated having you at the club. Do you have any good memories from those days at Laughs? Did you work with anybody that uh, ended up uh, uh, being either fast friends or a good inspiration for your career? Stan Sellers. We're still buddies. We still go try to go to lunch at least once a month, maybe once every two months. Still stay, keeping in touch. Uh, first times in Sacramento was uh, my first ride in a limo when Stockton opened. <laughs> working with Mac and Jamie. That's why. Oh, that's a great show. Yeah. So that's how it, that was the grand opening of Stockton. Hey, you remember flying to Monterey? Yes. Prior, yeah. 
I, I was able to be part of that trip. We flew and had lunch. I don't know what you were doing. Were you checking out a club or something? Yeah, I was uh, um, asked to uh, open and produce a show in this uh, small town. And so I chartered a plane and, and flew a small group of people. And we had lunch, but I was there doing some business. But uh, it was one of my more extravagant lunches. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I still have pictures of it. Oh, that's cool. You'll have to uh, share those. But uh, that's great that you and Stan Sellers got a chance to uh, meet and become such good friends. You were um, a feature act for a while, but you soon became a headliner. So people were coming to see you with the reputation you built at the club. Was there other people that you work with that maybe gave you some inspiration? Or you being the yeah. headliner, you were you were the star? Well, <laughs> I remember John Hinton and I had a one a fun week because we were both co-headlining. Yeah, and John we, we just a strong act too. Yeah, we were, and we were just pushing each other. It was friendly. It was all, it was all fun, and it was like follow that. And it was John. John well, John and I are still pretty close. Well, not that we see each other, but we communicate on Facebook and stuff. Uh, Denny Johnson, of course. Yeah, he Amazing. was he was a, a crowd favorite and a longtime regular at the sh clubs. Oh yeah. Oh, hey, we we did we shot some. I remember now shooting a TV series, segments for a TV series that you did for a while briefly. Yeah, but I remember at, live at laughs and then laughs almost live. We had those two shows that ran on ABC and NBC local affiliates, but uh, it helped put us on the map in the uh, mid to late eighties. Yeah. I, I just loved the whole setup in Old Sack, the, the when it was under the firehouse and the magic hat upstairs. Yeah, that was my favorite club. I got to design it from uh, uh, from the get go, and and I think it was one of the, uh, if I don't mind uh, blowing my own horn, one of the best comedy clubs in the country, just out of design. Oh, it was. It was. You know, everybody talks about they don't. Uh, if you use an audition tape from the Ice House, at least the way it was. They didn't hear because it was such a magical room. Old Sack's room is exactly like that. It was perfect. It was just, oh, you know who I worked with that comes from Denny, Dennis Wolfberg. Oh, Dennis Wolfberg. Well, he was a, a teacher as well. So I would assume you'd have uh, some uh, good conversations. I had great conversations. Here's the deal. Comics can be weird. So I'm on the road doing my teaching stuff. And comics would go, hey, Dennis Wolfberg does teaching stuff. I was like, okay. <laughs> so then I, I ended up working old sack with Dennis Wolfberg. He was headlining. And I was featuring for him, and he's a, just a perfect example of a class guy and a head, a real headliner. And I said, Dennis, people are getting on my back because I do teaching stuff, and you do teaching stuff. And if you want, I won't do my teaching stuff, and you can have, you know, I won't mess up. But he goes, Did you teach school? And I went, Yeah. He goes, what grade did you teach? And I said, elementary school. And he goes, I taught junior high. He goes, don't worry about it. You do your teaching stuff. I'll either refer back to it or I won't get to it. But no, you got to be you. Teach, do your teaching stuff. He was just such a class guy. Yeah. And Dennis, funny. Dennis Wolfberg has been mentioned several times by several comics as one of those. Uh, and you put it very distinctly as a class act who was uh, very funny. Uh, we lost him way too early, but he was so good at relating to the audience. And he makes a good point that it's like, well, I can't do airport material because you once went to an airport. I mean, it's it's crazy. You had different experiences as teachers. It still all relates to the audience. So why not? I mean, it, there's no reason that you couldn't both do that material. And he was absolutely correct. And if I remember correctly, it was a terrific show. It was so good. Well, two different perspectives too. He's coming from the East coast doing, talking about older kids. I'm talking about Midwest and then some teaching in California. And remember the night I really remember is a special night and it could bring me to tears. Dennis was having such a great time in the audience. It was just one of those magical nights. And remember he, Somebody had a guitar, and he picked up the guitar and sang uh, American, uh, Pie. By American Pie. And it was just, I mean, as I think of it, I'm getting emotional. It was just beautiful. It was just amazing night, magical. Yeah, I, I'll, and, and you're right. It could bring tears to you because it was, 
Dennis Wolfberg, who had this kind of raspy voice and and talking about uh, uh, being from New York and his his accent and his years in teaching. People made fun of his name, Wolfberg, and called him Wolf Shit and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but but when he grabbed the guitar and sang uh, Bye Bye American Pie, it, I mean, standing ovation, you know, everybody just went nuts. And, and I'm glad you were able to experience that because not everybody did. And uh, we were always so thrilled to uh, have him at the club, but to have you and him together would have been just golden. Yeah, and I because I I'm there right now. I'm sitting in that stairway that went up to the Magic Hat. I'm sitting in the stairway, we're watching the stage and watching Dennis. Oh, just wonderful. Yeah. Oh, thanks for sharing that memory. That that is a special one. Now you worked for me, as we said, uh, over many years and and had great success at the club. Uh, you ended up uh, being the uh, house MC and host at the Ice House. Um, going into the two thousands. And 2010, uh, were, is it a balance of club work and corporate work? What, where did you find your income? Because I met in early to 2000s, I worked with George Lopez. And I was opening for George. It, it, he was at the Ice House, and he said, well, why don't you come to the improv with me? And I went, okay. So I just started working around. I was traveling all over with George. And which is really impressive because we did a theater in Chicago and Arizona and Houston. And this was before, the, you know, internet, media, mass media and all that stuff. He was selling out theaters back then. I don't know how, but it was a great experience and stuff. And then I met Arsenio. And Arsenio was cool enough that he, all of a sudden he booked me at the improv to open for him. And he only saw five minutes of me. And I went, Arsenio, thanks bringing me with you and booking you. He goes, I knew there was more than five minutes. It was really complimentary. We worked off and on for 20 years. Wow. I mean, both of those gentlemen, but especially George Lopez, had a hook in that he was one of the first clean Hispanic comics to really have that mass appreciation of his material. And having somebody like you that's totally clean, very relatable, and fun and easy is such a great setup for him to follow. Same as Arsenio Hall. They could be a little edgier. They could take it down their ethnic path and not feel like they've uh, had anything but a great support or base to the show. And I'm talking as a producer that, that you would bring to the stage. And it sounds like uh, that was a, a huge moment for you and very, um, profitable and successful for both of those stars. Oh yeah. And just when, cause I did warm up them for, remember Arsenio briefly hosted star search, the yeah. new star search. I did audience warm up for him at star search. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that audience warm ups yeah. a whole different game for uh, everybody in the audience. We've talked about the many paths that uh, stand up comedy can take you from a professional entertainer to a writer, to a, a punch up person, to voiceovers, but um, sitcom warm up or TV warm up is something that a lot of people um, had a good living doing. Yeah, great living. Great living. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of Jim, Jim Brogan and uh, Ron Pearson. Jim Brogan, Ron, Roger Lundblad. Well, Roger Lundblad, that's how I got into the ice house because I was filling in for him on weekends because he was starting to get more warm up work. Then he went total warm up, and that's when I got the ice house MC gig. And, oh, and then I, in that process, Brad Garrett was wrapping up Everybody You Loves Raymond. Is that it? Yes. See, I go. Everybody hates Chris. I got confused. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, everybody loves Raymond. Right, right. We lost uh, Ray Romano. He was a regular at the club until he got uh, started. You know, got the Tonight Show, and then that boom led to uh, his own sitcom. But uh, Brad did. Garrett, being the co-star of that show, had a long career on TV. He still um, owns and manages a comedy club in Vegas. But a lot of people don't know he was doing stand-up comedy for many years before television. I think he's the original Star Search winner back when Ed McMahon and those guys. Oh, see, I didn't know that. That's a nice little tidbit. So uh, did you do some work with Brad? 
did I do some work with Brad? Holy mackerel. It just happened a good timing. I, it was, I think it was about 95, 96. They were wrapping up Everybody Loves Raymond. And Brad was starting to go back on the road again, or starting to do stand up. And he came to the Ice House and we talked. And I was able to tour with him just when they were showing the last season, the last episodes of uh, Everybody Loves Raymond. In fact, we did, we flew to New York. And he said, uh, do you mind hanging out in New York for a couple of days? I have to do some PR. And I said, I've never been to New York. And he goes, good, I don't want to fly you home. Spend, stay out here and we'll have some fun. And I watched the last episode. Everybody was Raymond with the cast. Oh, how cool. It was very cool. And everybody was so cool. Oh, wait a minute. James Lipton, Actors Alley, or Actors. Right. Uh, the, the, the cast did that on the Sunday night. And Brad, again, being gracious, went, you don't have to come, but you want to come with us? And I went, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was really, so, like you said, very gracious of Brad to include you in all those really once-in-a-lifetime moments. Yeah, because, yeah, I'll never, those are the moments that are just amazing. We went to, oh, so two limos, when we were done, I got to on camera at the Actors Alley or whatever it was. And uh, two limos on the way home. One limo went to stop at pizza on the way and the other went back to the hotel and I went in the pizza limo and I know people in New York, the limo pulls up to a, a pizza stand. Ray Romano gets out, Brad gets out, uh, Hera, what's her name? The wife. Anyway, everybody's getting out and you know, people are going, Oh, who's a, and there's a, and then I got out and it was like, everybody's going, who's that? <laughs> 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 but I got to experience it. Yeah, no, fun. that that would be so much fun. And and uh, uh, obviously, I've spent uh, a lot of time around celebrities. And it, it's the same feeling is that people are looking at you kind of going, well, how do you fit into this picture? Right? Yeah. Uh, and, and I, you know, I would just, you know, it didn't affect me because I didn't have any ego about it. But it was uh, so f uh, interesting that that people wanted, they're almost curious as to how are you hanging with these celebrities, right? Yeah, so it was fun. But, you know, moments like that are just priceless. They, they live with me forever. They, it was right. It was true. We went to the 9-11 site and talked to the firemen across the street. It was just some wonderful moments and hilarious moments and very cool. So uh, anyway. That's very special. Thanks for sharing that story. And uh, to hear a softer side to Brad Garrett, because he's had a little bit of a reputation as a, as a hard ass, as a club owner and in some of the um, public stuff he's done and to hear him interacting with the firefighters and, and taking you on these amazing adventures uh, is really paints a nice picture. He, he's been, he's been great to me. Matter of fact, I just was back in Vegas working his club in March. Oh, great. Congratulations. Yeah. Well, let's, yeah. let's move towards that. Cause you've had all these great experiences starting as a teacher, becoming a stand up comedy, having great success, a great career doing that. It led you to opening up for George Lopez, Arsenio Hall and Brad Garrett and working all these different things. But both of us are, are getting a little older and I know yes. that uh, because we're friends that you recently shared that uh, you found out you have Parkinson's disease. Do you want to yeah. share how that's affected you as, as an entertainer? As an entertainer? Well, for, as a person, I didn't know what was going on because I, I used to run a lot, jog and run and run marathons and stuff. And it was just one time my left arm wasn't swinging. And then I started tripping over my left foot. And so physically, it was affecting me. And I thought I had a stroke. Well, yeah, those are kind of the common traits of a stroke is you lose one side of your body. Yeah. Oh, and especially with COVID, this is weird. This was before COVID, obviously, because I was diagnosed five years ago officially, but I know I've been having it for eight years. Loss of sense of smell. I didn't know that. I didn't either. And it's funny because Pete, my girlfriend, who I've lived with for 20 years, she didn't, you know, skeptical. Come on, you can still smell. And the neighbors had fresh manure put on their front lawn, you know? And everybody's just going, oh, I hate, oh. And I bent over and went, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you don't smell shit. <laughs> I, exactly. Well said. And it was like, are you serious? And I went, yeah. 
I Googled that like you're, you know, like you're not supposed to do. And it was like, well, some men lose their sense of smell when they get older and this and that. And, and then when I finally diagnosed with Parkinson's, one of the first two things that popped up, well, Parkinson's, you lose your sense of smell and your arm doesn't swing when you walk. So it was like, why didn't anybody tell me that before? Yeah, it's not the kind of thing that you think about. Like you said, you would think stroke or some other issue, especially with COVID running around. Well, I know that we were uh, shocked and disappointed to hear that you were ill, but we also have uh, great positive feelings that with your lifestyle and your positive attitude that uh, you can overcome this. How are you dealing with um, having Parkinson's now and your comedy career? Well, thank goodness for meds, drugs, Cord- Cordoba, Levodopa, Cordoba, wait a minute. That sounds like a made, made up name, Cordoba, Doba, Doba, Doba. <laughs> That's it. You're right. Carbidopa, Levodopa. There it is. Carbidopa, Levodopa. It's a synthetic uh, dopamine. And so that's the problem. That's where Parkinson's is. It's the breakdown of dop- dopamine, uh, not getting communicated to your brain. So that's why you, some your physical stuff changes. Oh, I should tell everybody here too. Every Parkinson's patient is different. Everybody gets, I don't have the tremors yet, but I just, I'm stiff and so I move slow. So anyway, the time the drugs and so far I just look clumsy apparently, but letting the part peep, letting the audience in, on head that I have Parkinson's at the end of the act. That's become my new closer, but it's working strong. Well, that's interesting uh, on two points. First, um, I deal with a Parkinson's uh, patient. My father-in-law has uh, advanced Parkinson's, and the, stre- the tremors and the shakes are a major indication of when he's having good days and bad days. When he's calm, relaxed, and it's in the morning, he's you know, he can hold a cup of coffee, but by noon, or if he gets upset, he can't hold any sort of uh, beverage because he's shaking so much. So the fact that you don't have the tremors or the shaking is a good indication of how early in this dreadful disease that your doctors caught it. But also from an artistic point of view, I think it's both smart and interesting that you were able to take something that a lot of people deal with that nobody talks about and bring it into your act. How did how do you um, bridge that in your act? How do you go from your material on being a teacher to dealing with Parkinson's? Well, I talk about just what I was telling you, how something was going on with me physically and I didn't know what it was, and then I get diagnosed. And I talk about that attitude is a choice. And, you know, oh, you know, Scott, if we talked a conversation before we got on the phone or the interview, that I may have a video and I'll send it to you if, if it gets pushed, but you'll see how I blend in being positive and, and trying to find the positive parts of having Parkinson's and giving people hope. You know what I mean? Oh, well, that's great. And ladies and gentlemen, at the end of this interview, we'll share a few minutes of that uh, comedy set with you. But for the conversation and for the interview, Jimmy, I think it's fascinating and really smart and you're actually doing something for society when you talk about how important it is to have a positive mental attitude and it doesn't have to just be parkinson's it could be all the 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 various cancers it could be any sort of mental or physical ailment you're dealing with that uh comedy and humor is a strong positive way to deal with these setbacks right and and you, that's exactly. what you've done with your act exactly i'm seeing if i can pull up a text message i got the other day because he summed it up well he summed it up better than i did so hold on ding, 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 ding. Yeah, a little music oh here it is oh so this is Jimmy, a you were amazing oh this was i did a uh, fundraiser the other day amazing house oh my goodness anyway it was in la Canada. This is from Ron Pearson, who booked me to do the show. Everyone loved you, and thank you so much for doing the gig. Miss you, brother, and really proud of how you're attacking your diagnosis with comedy. Yeah, that's strong. <clears throat> that's, that- yeah, and that sums it up. It's like, I'm well, you know, I didn't want to be downer as a teacher, and I, and I don't want to be a downer as a person, so I'm finding the humor in it. And I hope I hope we get that clip up otherwise, because I, I want to do a couple punchlines, but I really don't want to in case we put the video up and 
spoils the surprise, you know? Yeah, no, let's save it for the video. We'll figure that part out. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, that'll be coming up in just a few minutes. But as an old friend, Jimmy, I just wanted to say, first off, thank you uh, very much for all the years of tremendous, clean, entertaining, relatable comedy that you brought to my various club locations. You always please the audience. You were always easy to work with. The staff always appreciated having you there. And uh, congratulations on your uh, many decades of success as a stand-up comic. Thank you. Oh, I remember bowling at Sacramento. Remember, we, once in a while we go bowling afterwards. <laughs> yeah, we would take certain comics, not everybody, but we, ones that we liked. Uh, uh, we would take them out bowling, and, and uh, that was a good after-show uh, stress reliever. We'd have a few drinks and, and uh, bowl horribly, but laugh a lot. Team building, they call it. <laughs> Team really, building, a- laughs unlimited style. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. So, oh, before, you know, some oh, other memories, ahead. I was able to do a couple New Year's Eves up there, too. Oh, and those are always special shows, aren't they? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They were great shows. Fun. And, and you know what? Your club, your team, it was like family. It was like going to see the, a family on the road. It was just, it was, it was really nice. It was fun and good and good people. Uh, well, Fun people. Thanks for sharing that. And, and that's how we felt about you, Jimmy. Now, before we uh, move into your uh, comedy set and end this interview, uh, what I know that you're dealing with the, the Parkinson's, but I know you're also still performing. Is there anything coming up at the end of uh, 2022 or coming in 2023 that uh, you're excited about or looking forward to? Oh, you know, I just got back to getting into the flow. Uh, I don't know. I'll just have to, they'll just have to keep me posted. I'll have to keep them posted. You can find me on Facebook or I have a website I should update. It's called the teacher comedian.com teacher, com- the teacher comedian.com. Yeah. Okay. I should. Well, I ladies should and gentlemen, check out Jimmy Burns at the teacher comedian.com. And we hope you enjoyed all the great information and stories he shared on this show. But right now we have a special treat. My good friend Jimmy Burns is going to share some uh, recorded live stand-up comedy to end this show. We like to end all of our shows with some stand-up. So that's what we're going to do. Jimmy, thanks for joining me on the show today. You're very welcome. My pleasure, Ken. It was like a reunion family, family reunion. (laughs) Well, I feel that way as well. Ladies and gentlemen, coming up right now, live on stage. Uh, Was this taped at the Ice House? No, the Ice House ended. This, this is taped at Flappers. Flappers, you know what? okay, Flappers Comedy Club. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, live at Flappers, it's the amazing school teacher turned comic and my good friend Jimmy Burns. Enjoy the comedy right here. Thanks, Jimmy. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. Hello. Hi, righty. My name is Jimmy, originally from Omaha, Nebraska. Thanks for the love. Feel the love in the room. Moved out here. It's expensive out here. Did you know that? Did you know that? Did you know that? Give you an example if you don't understand. I owned a house in Omaha. Owned it. Owned it. Sold it, moved out here, put a down payment on a car. Two thousand nine Ford Focus. Oh man. Been married a couple times. Not giving up. Trying it again. Got a woman in my life, but I'm getting older. Woo! Jack Cohen, young man. I'm older than he is. This is how old I am. My spam email has even changed, young lady. When I was a young man, my spam email, enlarge a penis, enlarge a penis, enlarge a penis. I spam email now, shrink your prostate, shrink your prostate. Shrink your prostate. <laughs> I got my crew over here, yay. So when you get older, things even change when it comes to dating. Your priorities, they're different. When I was a young man, look looked for one with long legs. Long, long ass legs. Ah. And booty. Legs and ass. Woman I'm with right now, not so much. She has a house. (laughs) 
She doesn't have legs and ass, she has assets. <laughs> moving to the South Bay. If you live in Hermosa Beach, you say, we live in Hermosa Beach. If you live in Manhattan Beach, you say, we live in Manhattan Beach. If you're like us and live in Hawthorne, you say, we live in the South Bay. So glad you came out to laugh. We gotta find the humor in life, yes? Gotta find the funny, yay? This is what's happened to me recently. I had a little health challenge pop up. My left side wasn't matching my right side. My left side, yeah, just hanging, doing its own thing, tripping over my foot. And I thought, uh-oh, did I have a stroke? So I went to the doctor. The doctor sent me to a neurologist. The neurologist gave me an MRI. And then a couple weeks later, he sat me down and said, you have not had a stroke. And I went, all right. And he goes, I think it's Parkinson's. <laughs> I know, I went, whoa, you mean I'm like Michael J. Fox? And he went, no, he's famous. <laughs> But I'm going, keeping the attitude up, gonna take my meds, working on it. But I had to tell my girl, my baby, my sweetie, I said, we are not married, there's no commitment here. If you do not want to go through this with me, I understand completely, just move on, go on your own way. And she went, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. I know, I went, really? She went, this is my house. <laughs> We hope you enjoyed this episode of Stand Up Comedy, your host and MC. For information on the show, merchandise, and our sponsors, or to send comments to Scott, visit our website at www.standupyourhostandmc.com. Look for more episodes soon and enjoy the world of stand up comedy. Visit a comedy showroom near you.